Good morning, church family. Welcome to TCBC as we have a few more people trickle in. I'm happy to be the first one to welcome you here for our service. We have people in person, as you can all see, and also people online. So hello to our online friends. Um, if you would like to follow along with today's service, we do have an online bulletin option. You can go to tcbc.cc slash bulletin. And now I invite you to stand for our call to worship. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Or who has given a gift to him to receive a gift in return? Amen. Let's join in our worship team in a couple of songs. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Uh, you all looking so lovely this morning. Uh, the first song is not a the first songs are going to be a medley, and you will see it. Uh, and we were talking about it with Keith when you were younger, and you know your parents were holding your hand, and you walking into church. Everybody seems so happy, dressed up. You know that church feeling. I hope you can remember it even as we play. All right.
bless you. And this is greeting time. Please feel free to greet somebody next to you. So like it always does, the church seemed to fill up more through those songs. So if you came in then, or even if you came in earlier, welcome again to TCBC. Our mission at this church is to see campus and community transformed by Christ to renew the world. So all of my life, I've been on the community side of that mission until last week when I stepped over to the campus side as a freshman. So I'm excited to be doing my first time emceeing as a campus member. So my name is Caroline Thies, and I'm excited about that mission. And if you're excited about that mission, we invite you to join our church family and get connected. We have an online connection card to let us know you're here. And there's also a place on that card for prayer requests. If you are feeling past all the online things, we do have paper connection cards, a couple in each pew. They are yellow, as Mr. Ross is holding one up. Um, we're excited to be bringing those back, and you can place them in the offering plate or in the foyer after the service. We also have our TCBC website. If you are looking for a place that always has consistent information, tcbc.cc. If you want that information in your inbox every week, you can sign up for our mailing list at tcbc.cc slash email. And you can follow us on social media. Our Instagram and Facebooks are on the screen. Um, we also have opportunities for prayer. So if you would like, you can join our TCBC prayer wall and post prayer requests online. You can also see other prayer requests and mark that you've prayed for people. That's a fun way to get connected. And we also have Wednesday evening prayer on Zoom on Wednesdays at 7 o'clock. If you are new this week or last week and you didn't grab one, we do have mugs in the foyer for you. They're fun. All sorts of different colors. If you're a student and you need some more orange and blue, we have orange. We have blue. We also have purple, pink, turquoise. There's a whole rainbow out there. And there's some information about our church and some other little goodies in there. We also have another opportunity to get connected after the service today. We will be having pizza in the parking lot at 1130 or after church. If church ends before 1130, there will be ice cream. So we can have a reverse lunch. Um, and that's especially for new people for getting connected, but also all members. I'm excited to see everyone there. And if you can't make it today, we will also be having a lunch after church next week at lab for Labor Day, a picnic in the park. So we aren't providing the food for that one. So remember to pack something. If you forget, you can always walk down to Jimmy John's or Grubhub something. And that will be at Carl Park. So just a couple blocks, I think that way. Yeah. Um, if you can't make it to that one, we have another lunch. If you are interested in volunteering with childcare, you have to, a little more qualification to get into that one, but that will be on the 12th, I believe. And now I'm going to hand it over to Kay Miller for an announcement from the nominating committee. Thanks, Caroline. It's been fun watching her grow up to go to college now. She's one of my neighbors. But anyway, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here this morning, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Leadership Council and the Nominating Committee. It's time, again, to begin that nominating process for our church leadership. And so the committee has started meeting, and we would love to have your input. Um, by September 13th, as you prayerfully discern um, who may be someone that you should nominate to be one of the senior leaders at our church will be accepting nominations for leadership council and for the shepherding team. Uh, if you have questions, you can look at our constitution to learn more about the details of the process. But for right now, what you need to know is that if you know a spiritually mature person who is growing in their walk with the Lord and supports the TCBC mission, vision, and doctrines, but don't know where they would best fit, the following may help. If they are attracted to big picture items, vision development, writing policy and procedures, and or administrative oversight, the Leadership Council might be the best fit. 
If they're attracted to one-on-one -on -one discipleship, personal encouragement, and conflict resolution, and or mentoring, the shepherding team may be a good fit for them. We'll be accepting nominations through September 13th when the committee meets, and we'll begin looking through the names that we've been given and praying through that, and we'll come up with a slate of candidates for our annual meeting later this fall. You may email your suggestions to the uh, church office or the nominating committee. And if you have questions, you can speak to one of the um, nominating committee members. That includes me, Andy Kim, Sandy Newport, Steve Ross, Ron Walder, and Brian Scott. We look forward to seeing who you might nominate, suggest for our, our next round of leadership. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Great to see you all. I am Brian Scott, the lead pastor here. Uh, we're first going to go to the Lord in prayer for our congregational prayer, and then we'll jump into the sermon. Congregational prayer is really just an opportunity for us as a people to go before our God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are grateful to gather here this morning. We're reminded of your word that says in Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget none of his benefits. He heals all of our diseases. He forgives all of our sins. Lord, we are in need of both healing and forgiveness this morning. As we come together, Lord, we are reminded that over the course of the week, there are so many ways where we have fallen short, where we have sinned against you, we've sinned against others, we have sinned by commission, we have sinned by omission. And we've even sinned without knowing it. But we thank, we're thankful for the power of the blood of Jesus that washes away all of our sins. And Lord, we confess our sin to you. We ask for your forgiveness as a people this morning. We thank you that you also heal our diseases. God, we lift up to you those in our congregation who are suffering physically, emotionally, mentally, or in other ways. God, we thank you for uh, Debbie Cassell's a good report of her surgery this past Monday that went well. We pray for full recovery from her. We're grateful for Warren Buck and how he is progressing along from his bone marrow transplant. We pray, Father, that his body would continue to respond well and for grace in his uh, continued development um, moving forward. God, we're thankful for others, Lord, as they go through various physical situations. Lord, we pray your blessing over them, God. I remember uh, Ellie Reif this morning. God, I pray for your continued grace over her, Lord, and Emmy Bloom, uh, the, the Bloom's granddaughter, Emmy, God, and I pray just your continued blace, grace in these situations. But Lord, we also remember, God, that sin has affected our world in such powerful ways. We pray, God, in Afghanistan, as there is a very tenuous situation, ongoing pain and death and fear. We pray for the light of Jesus to shine in the hearts of your people, and we pray, God, that you would be glorified in the midst of this. We pray for wisdom over those who have power to impact that situation. Well, we remember those recovering in Haiti. We pray for grace in all of that. And Lord, so many other situations near and far, even in our own community with gun violence that has gone on really throughout the pandemic and this summer. We pray for your peace in Champaign-Urbana. And Lord, this morning we lift up uh, one of our own, Troy Rendleman, in his efforts as a missionary to the college campus here at U of I uh, through CREW. We thank, we're thankful that as a church we get to partner with those who are reaching the next generation. We pray blessing over his ministry we pray, God, that in fall outreach that you would give him and his team divine appointments with students and in help uh, those returning to in-person activity really acclimate in his ministry. And Lord, this morning we pray as we come to you to hear your word that you would open our hearts and open our ears that we would respond to what you are saying. And Lord, give me grace to minister your word and be faithful to you. We're thankful for our time here together. Holy Spirit, lead us and have your way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, 
I want to dismiss our kids. It's not quite 11.30 yet, but there will be pizza and ice cream later, so go, go be good at kids' time. <laughs> if you are on Zoom, you can turn off your videos. Um, and I think, I've, I think I've cleared house here at this point. Um, so we're going to transition. I was thinking, I was really inspired, Brian, watching you up here. I was like, maybe I could do my sermon and play the drums at the same time. <laughs> I don't know how you did that. You're singing, you're strumming, you're tapping. That's amazing. <clears throat> you won't ever see me doing that. All right. A couple of precursory notes and we'll jump into our sermon here. By the way, our text today is Romans chapter 2, or not Romans, Revelation chapter 2. I was just checking to see if you're still with me. Revelation 2, 1 through 17, you can go ahead and turn there. My wife and kids are at home today, so I will miss them. Um, I need extra encouragement. Um, and I just, uh, just a heads up, I will have an, ex- so I'm going to do my regular t- routine, read, and just share my points. And my third point, though, I will have an excursus on something that's very current and close uh, that many of you are aware of. More on that later. But uh, hey, welcome students. And uh, it was great to be at InterVarsity this past Friday night and see many of you there and look forward to being a crew later in a few weeks. All right. Let's look, in, let's look at the text. Revelation 2, 1 through 17. Revelation 2, 1 through 17. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil. But you have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the first love the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet you have this, yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And the angel, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an, ear, has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. And to the angel of the church of Pergamum, write, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not... I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. And I will give him a white stone with the new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. 
This is God's word. We're in the second week of our sermon series in Revelation called Overcomers. And that name is significant because, as we just read, in three instances, this is our Lord Jesus, our risen Lord, speaking to John of what to write, and he's talking about to the one who conquers, to the one who conquers. That Greek word is the same word. It, really, it means overcome. The book of Revelation is about the church being overcome. It's first about Jesus Christ being our great overcomer and about how he has called us to be overcomers as well because we live in a world where sin, Satan, and the worldly way of things presses against us. Today's text, there's three things that we should take away or take note of. Three necessities of those who overcome represented in these three churches and the warnings given. Number one is love. Number two is endurance. Number three is holiness. Love endurance, holiness. Three things that we need, th three things that are necessities of those who overcome. In a brief summary, what Jesus is saying to the church in our text this week is to get back to the heart of the gospel. You've gotten off. He's correcting and rebuking the church for getting away from it. Now, mind you, these are individual messages to seven churches. However, this is a whole unit. All of Revelation is a letter to all of the church. It may surprise some of you this morning what Jesus is critiquing about these churches and how severe he considers their issues to be. And they are all completely relevant to the contemporary church. If you were not here last week or you've forgotten, last week we were reading chapter one and much of what we see in this text is based on chapter one, the things that Jesus is saying and the entry point of each entry to the, letter, to the seven churches, he's referencing back to that vision, that glorious vision of the risen Christ that we saw in chapter one. We also recognize that Revelation is an apocalyptic document which means it's prophetic in nature, it's future-oriented, it's talking about end times, but it also is filled with symbolism that you cannot just simply read as literal. Again, not saying that you don't read the Bible literally, but you have to recognize the genre that is represented in books like Parts of Daniel or Ezekiel, where there are images that you have to understand what is, what is, it being, what is being spoken of here. But it's also an epistle, so it, 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 it's a letter. It has relevance to these late first century hearers and what they were going, to, going through. And, and then what we also recognize is Revelation gives us a picture of the fullness of Jesus' ministry, his incarnation and his introduction of bringing forth the kingdom, his ministry in the age of the church as we are in the age between his comings, and the fullness of his ministry of when he returns to consummate all things. So Revelation is giving us an image of that, a picture of that, and we'll talk more about this as weeks goes on. But when you read the book of Revelation, there are actually seven sections, and it's this progressive recapitulation. What that means is, if you've ever seen uh, a, a home run highlight, right? Have you ever seen a home run highlight? What, what happens? First, you'll see the guy, you're facing the guy at home plate, and then he hits it. Then they'll show another clip of him running the bases. Then they'll show another clip of the fan that catches it or the fan scrambling. Then they might show a clip of behind home plate, and then you see the, the reaction of the pitcher. You know? So you get maybe four or five different clips of the same event. That's what Revelation is. There are seven perspectives of the same sequence of events, the fullness of Christ's revelation, his first coming, the, it, the time between, and the second coming. More on that later. Let's dig into this week. Point one, love. You need this to be an overcomer, love. Now, this seems very basic, but there's a reason why this is here. The first of our three 
little letters here within the main letter is to the, the church in Ephesus. Ephesus was a leading city in Asia. In fact, the most populous city, a port city. So this amazingly influential city. It would be, you know, whatever country you could think of, the lead city of that country, the, the largest, most influential. It also was home to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the temple of Artemis, the temple of Diana. And so there was all of this um, cult ritual that took place, pagan worship that took place in this city. And so this church in Ephesus is in the midst of all of that cultural Um, the stream that's pushing towards pagan idolatry, but they're called to be faithful in the midst of that. And there are actually some things that they're doing well. Jesus says, which by the way, in case you didn't notice on the screen, these are this whole thing that we read this morning, all 17 verses is red letter. That's Jesus talking. And he says in verse two, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, how you cannot bear with those who are evil, You've tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. What is Jesus saying? They have good works. They're doing good things. They're, they hate evil. They, they're opposed to it. They're not, in, they're not in cahoots with evil going, around them, going on around them. They're not giving in to the temptation to jump into the flow of the pagan idolatry around them. They are patiently enduring. In fact, it says, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and have not grown weary. There's, there is persecution at this point in the Roman Empire for Christians that is spreading. Verse six, you have this, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. This is Jesus talking. So they have positioned themselves. Okay, these are people doing evil. These apostles, they're falsely claiming to be that. Jesus is saying, you're doing well. That's all good. You're identifying the evil around you and you're not giving into it. They're enduring persecution, probably persecution under Emperor Domitian at this point. The Nicolaitans, we don't know anything about except for what's in the text here. But Jesus has a problem with this church. What is it? They abandon their first love. Verses four and five, I have this against you. You've abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent. Do the works you did at first. If not, what's at stake? I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. We know from last week and from the first chapter that the lampstand represents the church itself. Jesus is saying, this is so severe, you will no longer be a church if you don't fix it. That's a big deal. They abandoned their first love. I mean, they were doing good things, but they abandoned the love that they had at first. Is, is, that, is that bad? It's certainly bad enough for Jesus to say, I will come and remove your lampstand. What was their first love? Well, their first love, obviously, is Jesus. I mean, that, the love of Jesus, that is the love that, it, it, from that love, all love stems. Recognizing God's love for us in Christ, that he first loved us, that we would respond to him in love, is how we derive love for everyone else, both believers and non-believers. So if they lost their first love, then they have lost love, period. And Jesus says, it is essential that as a Christian, that as Christians, that you hold on to love. If you lose that, you're not a part of me. How do they lose sight of Jesus? Because if it could happen to them, it could easily happen to us. How did they lose love? How are they doing good, but missing the main point? This is the warning for us. Revelation is both a book of encouragement and of warning to Christians, to the church. The picture of Ephesus and what's going on is a legalistic church. 
they got so wrapped up in the hatred of evil, the hatred of groups like the Nicolaitans, they got so wrapped up in exposing falsehood, that's a false prophet, that's a false apostle, that that became their very identity. The thing that they wanted to be known for. I mean, think about it. They were in a city with the massive temple of Artemis, one of the ancient wonders of the world. And can you imagine the cultural impact of such a collective in idolatry and what it would be like to be a Christian in the midst of that? I mean, it affects social interaction. It affects um, just the culture around you. So there's a real temptation that if everyone else is living that way, to live that way. But they said, no, we won't live that way. We're drawing the line, then that's evil. But they began, they began to gain their identity in how they called out evil. They enjoyed exposing evil so much that that became their greatest desire. They got so wrapped up in matters of justice that they, just, they loved justice more than they loved Jesus. And Jesus says to you this morning, if this is you, you need to repent. You need to turn back. You need to come back to me. Turn away from legalism and turn back to Jesus. In turning back to Jesus, you recover love for both God and man. What was at stake was if they did not repent, he would remove their lampstand. They would cease to be a church. Now, whether that meant they would be obliterated or whether that would mean he would withdraw his spirit and they might continue on doing their activities, but he would not be present or blessing them, I don't know. But neither of those options is good. I certainly don't want either of those. He called them to repent. And we see in the heart of Jesus, even as bad as that was, he still offered mercy. You have a chance to turn. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers or to the one who overcomes. I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. If they turn, they will get to eat the blessing of what Adam and Eve lost when they turned away from God in the garden. If they turn back to Jesus in the, in, in, the, in the time to come, the age to come, the age of righteousness, the end time promise is that they would eat of the tree of life. We need to hold on to love. Second point, endurance. Endurance. Most scholars believe this book, Revelation, was written probably mid-90s, you know, first century, by the Apostle John. There's debate about that, but there's very good reasons to believe that. About 100 years later, we have an existing account from a woman in the Roman Empire, Vivia Perpetua, who was martyred. And she has these visions that she writes about what it would be like to be martyred and then sort of has this account on the eve of when she goes to be martyred. It's something that you can read. And you get this, you, you start to get, just it, reading something like that, it starts to sink in what life was like. She has this vision of she's going to enter into the arena and then is going to have to face these animals and fight for her life. And she says she wakes up from that and she realizes that it was a dream because when the time comes, she says, I won't be fighting with beasts. I'll be fighting with the devil himself. Just the vividness of that reality. When Jesus addresses the church in Smyrna, they are about to encounter a severe tribulation, a severe testing a severe persecution. So on the, on the big scale, if you think that Revelation, and I'm not here to 
really dig into this, but if you, if you think that Revelation is saying tribulation is something that's coming in the future, you're not really giving weight to what the church who received this letter was experiencing in their, in their own present. The first hearers, they were going through it, a, a severe tribulation under Emperor Domitian. And look at how Christ addresses this church in verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Jesus identifies with and gently reminds this church of their union with him. He's saying, I died. I endured suffering. I am your crucified, risen Lord, and I came to life. It is me who is addressing you. It is me who is walking with you amidst the persecution that you are enduring and are about to endure. Verse nine, he says, I know your tribulation and your poverty. This is a church that was poor and, and some would say precisely because they were Christian, it affected their own economy. Uh, the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer the devil is coming to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and for 10 days you will have tribulation. Verse 11, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. They are experiencing tribulation. It is about to intensify. And Jesus is saying the source of that tribulation, the efficient cause of that tribulation is the devil himself. Remember the comment of Perpetua. How does that work? Well, just even briefly, Jesus is acknowledging that they're being maligned by those who are, they call themselves Jews and they could, well, so at, at this point, Jews and Christians, there's a distinction earlier, you know, a few decades earlier, you know, from the outsider's perspective, it wasn't clear what Christians really were. They were kind of this subset of Jews. Now there's this distinction that's being made and and, and Jewish uh, folks are, are actually sort of, you know, for lack of a better word, tattletailing on Christians and they're, and they're being um, put forth for persecution. And Jesus is acknowledging that there is a demonic origin to that, such that what we need to understand is that there is actually resistance that happens in the church that's not just people. It might be a person doing something or it might be people saying something, but that's not the origin. That is not the efficient cause. It's actually satanic. It's demonic because the devil, as we'll see further in the book of Revelation, in, an, in the realm of the spirit is pushing against and trying to thwart the church, which is why we need to overcome. Some of the opposition that we face as Christians is attributed to the devil. And if that's the case, you can't simply fix it by problem solving. This is why prayer is so important. One of the reasons why prayer is so important in the life of a believer, because not all of our issues are just simply mental or physical. They are spiritual. How does Jesus encourage them? Well, if you can receive this for an encouragement, he's saying, be faithful unto death. Be faithful unto death. Be willing to die. Why? Because if you do, you are, in, you are an overcomer. And if, you go, and, if you, and if you are faithful unto death, the second death won't hurt you. The second death, that is eternal condemnation in hell. For the one who, over, who overcomes his concern, hell is not a concern for him or her. The encouragement is don't turn your back on Jesus, regardless of the persecution, whether that be verbal, whether that be mortal, physical, what have you. All right, point three, holiness. So we need love. We need endurance, but we also need holiness. And what do I mean by holiness? Does that mean that you have green hair and you say weird things? You know, what does that mean? No, that is not what that means. Christian holiness boils down to the fact that when Jesus died for you and you became a part of his family, 
He has called you to live for him. And he's called you to be set apart from the culture around you, from the way that everyone else is doing things. The way you do life should look different because Jesus is the one calling the shots. The church in Pergamum has lost sight of that. But Jesus starts with things that they have done well too. Verse 13, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you. So they are enduring. You need to endure. They're enduring. Check. They've held fast to the name of Christ. What was their issue? Verse 14. You can look with me. But I have a few things against you. You have some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Two issues here, eating food sacrificed to idols and sexual immorality. How do they get off track? Well, in Pergamum, Pergamum was the, the capital of the region. And in Pergamum, there was emperor worship that took place. And maybe this was the center place of the emperor worship. Domitian had reintroduced that. One of the ways that the rulers of the Roman Empire would try to hold his empire together was to require people to worship the emperor. And thus, folks were required to say, Caesar is Lord, which is why to say Jesus is Lord is so radical. But what got them off track was these bad teachings, these false teachers, this bad doctrine, the teaching of Balaam, Jesus says, and the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which is somewhat different, but somewhat related. Quick snapshot on Balaam, if you don't recall in numbers, um, there, was a, there were people who were opposed to the Israelites as they were marching their way through, headed into the promised land. And so Balak, as a king, hired Balaam to prophesy against the people of God. But there was a problem. He couldn't, he couldn't curse the people of God. He could only bless them. And so three times, Balak asked Balaam to prophesy curses, and Balaam only prophesied blessings. But then something tragic happens. In Numbers 25... You see, the people of Israel, though they survived this test, they fell into a deeper one. They aligned themselves with the pagan worship of the people around them and gave into two things, eating sacrifices to pagan gods and sexual immorality. So there's, a, there's an overlap. What's interesting about this teaching that was going on in late first century the teaching of Balaam, as Jesus refers to it, the teaching of the Nicolaitans. This teaching wasn't necessarily something outside the church trying to resist Christianity. It was something inside the church trying to improve it, trying to modernize it. If the church in Ephesus was a legalistic church, the church in Pergamum was one that was licentious. In other words, they thought grace meant, well, we could kind of do whatever because we're going to be forgiven. Or maybe we should just not have such strong boundaries. We could kind of do what everyone else is doing. So the error on the one side for the, the church in Ephesus was we're so fixated on how we define evil that that became our, that their identity. This church, they were so inclined towards, well, we want to be a little more relatable and you know, what's the big deal? That that became their identity. And Jesus has warnings for both. As Christians, we have to hold very carefully with doctrine because Jesus takes it very seriously. And if you cross the line in doctrine, he says, you're crossing me. There's a warning attached to this. These teachings were not modernizing or liberating the church but we're putting it in bondage. 
and we're creating a fence towards the risen Christ. Why? It was robbing him of his glory. That's not what his church was supposed to be about. Okay. Teaching that leads to sexual immorality, that's bad. Jesus says that. Here's my excursus. Now, what happens if the one who's teaching lives this way? This is where it gets close to home. Um, Perhaps you've heard or read uh, there was news articles that have come out from WBEZ in Chicago, NPR, uh, and locally WILL NPR Radio has reported on a church here in Urbana, Covenant Fellowship Church. Perhaps you've heard of that. Um, it's actually a church that TCBC has rented space, had rented space from for a lot of probably 20 years until we found out about this spring what was happening in the church. And if you're not familiar with the church, um, you can read about it, unfortunately, or listen to the podcast from the WILL radio. Just Google it. But the long and the short of it is that the pastor had committed an act of assault, covered it up for about 20 years, and then when it became light, others around him who had an opportunity and power to do something about it also covered it up. Additional to that, there are accounts of victims, and I won't go into details just because of young years, but there were other issues of assault happening in the church, and when young women would come to the pastor to seek counsel, his advice was, don't tell anybody. And that, went, that happened in who knows how many instances. And so given how public that is and given how close that is to home, I have to comment on it, unfortunately. Here's the reality, and I can't really, there's so much to say, but obviously, as we read about what Jesus' response is to these churches, he has a response to this too. And first of all, I just want to say for the victims, and I, who, the countless victims, many of them are anonymous, my heart goes out to them. And as a pastor, having ability, having power to do good and recognizing that there are those that use that for different purposes, I am so sorry. I mean, it just breaks my heart. I think about, I think about, I have two daughters. I think about if, it, if they were caught up in something like that, what would I do? And I actually don't know. You know, I don't know how I would respond if they were, it, it, but the point here is, for the victims that are out there, um, if ever, anyone ever hears of that, I am sorry that that happened. Um, we cut ties in terms of renting space with that church. They have an opportunity like these churches to repent. My prayer is that they do. If you have questions about that situation or you've been affected by it, please come and talk to me or come and talk to one of our shepherds or email our office if you want to set up a time to talk. As hurtful as that situation is and as disdainful as it is, we still have to examine our own hearts, right? Because the text here is, is pointed to us. We are gathered around this text. And Jesus is closing his remarks here to the church in Pergamum. Therefore, repent in verse 16. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Who? The ones that were teaching this bad doctrine that led people to sexual immorality and to eating food sacrificed to idols. But here is the hope. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Instead of eating food that is given to pagan worship, Jesus is offering the hidden manna. 
Instead of giving into what is surrounding us in the age of wickedness, Jesus is giving us a foretaste or a promise to taste something in the age of righteousness. We have to have a full picture of the ministry of Christ that he not only came, but he's coming back. And he's coming back to make things right and we will all have to give an account. What does this all mean? How do we keep from losing love or losing holiness? Here's a few, th- few thoughts. One, we need a balanced doctrine. You need a balanced doctrine. This is why it's so important for you to read all of scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. This is why we're doing Revelation. It's a book that a lot of Christians are very tentative about and it's a challenging book. But my heart as a pastor is that we would have the whole counsel of God and I wanna use this, the pulpit to be a place where we get exposed to a wide range of scripture. And especially for students in your time here, if you choose to worship here, that my hope is that by the time you, you graduate or you move on to the next thing in life, you will have had exposure to a wide range of God's counsel through his word. But individually, you should read all of scripture, try to get a broad understanding of what it's saying. If the, book, if the Christian books that you read are all written in the last 10 or 15 years or say 21st century, you might be off balance because you haven't accounted for your own cultural bias. You're swimming in the same milieu of the folks that are writing. You need to get behind that by reading from Christians from other time periods. That will help you have a balanced doctrine. If you only listen to those who deconstruct the church and they are offering to you really an alternative Jesus that's bound in 21st century culture, you haven't gained anything there either. You need to have a balanced doctrine. It's only the gospel, as we center on it, that keeps us from becoming legalistic or licentiousness because it's the gospel that reminds us that we are more sinful than we could ever, that we would ever admit, but we are more loved than we could ever hope for. And therefore we can't just create boundaries that judge other people. But on the other hand, and so that keeps us loving, the gospel keeps us holy because we realize that Jesus didn't just come to die so that we could have a ticket to heaven and go about our way, but we belong to him. And so that means our whole life should honor him and we hold on to holiness. And finally, it encourages us to endure because it reminds us he's coming again. Let's pray. Father, thank you for helping us this morning in your word. God, I pray that we would have a desire for love, endurance, and holiness. Continue to remind us of the things that you've spoken this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. As we think about those things that Pastor Brian invited us to reflect on, we're going to move into a time of response. One way we can respond is with those online connection cards I mentioned earlier. Um, There's a place for your prayer requests on the back, or you can just put your name in, put your email, that sort of thing. Um, Another way we can respond is with our tithes and offerings. So as we move into the next period, we will be having the ushers pass the plates around. You can also give um, by mailing a check to the address you see on the screen or going to tcbc.cc slash give. And the final way that we will be responding today um, in our service is with musical worship. So as we pass those offering plates around, we're going to have Brian and the worship team leading us in worship.
pray for the offering, Lord. We pray that it will be used to build your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you fly? <laughs> Sorry.
praise the Lord this morning. Before we do our benediction, I just got a text. So one of our brothers, Todd Kincaid, who's our facilities manager, he's been fighting some virus or something all week. It's not COVID, but he was just taken to the uh, ER. So he has, um, they think it's pneumonia. So I just want to take a moment and pray for him. He's like an Iron Man. So for him to not be out for so long, there's obviously an issue. Lord, we lift up our brother, Todd, and his family, Lisa, and their kids. Lord, we pray, Father, that you would give grace uh, to him as he goes to get fluids and testing um, and other things happening in the, in the ER. We pray that you would give quick wisdom to doctors and those who will care for him, God. And we pray for his recovery. We pray for strength in his lungs. We pray that uh, antibiotics or whatever is needed would, would get on board quickly, Lord, to help his recovery. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's receive the benediction. Uh, it comes from Revelation chapter one. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. The Lord bless you as you go this week. Please join us for pizza afterwards. And now let's sing the doxology.